Well, good morning again. It's Sunday, and I'm Pastor Dan here with Pastor Mike Kosminski, broadcasting from our home. Um, so today I'm going to open up in prayer and then uh, give my uh, communion exhortation. So, dear Jesus, we thank you. We thank you so much for uh, saving us and bringing us to the realization of who you are. Continue to guide us on this journey, O oh Lord. Open our eyes to see you everywhere, to hear you everywhere, to feel you everywhere, Lord. May we become bold in this hour. May we become um, fishers of men. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to open up in Isaiah 48. Um, and we're going to look at uh, scriptures 9, 10, and 11. I was going to read 49, the first five scriptures, but I'm going to let my husband do that. So 48, verse 9. For my name's sake, I will defer my anger. For God's name's sake. He could be very angry right now at the world. He could be very angry at the church. But he's going to defer that anger. For my praise, I will restrain it from you, so that I do not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. God couldn't even find silver. We didn't even have silver to give him. For my own sake, for my own sake, I will do it. For how much my name is to be profaned, for I will not give glory to another. Um, I really want us to think a minute about, do you take God for granted? Now, I was researching and I came across another sermon by John Piper. So this, again, these ideas are originated in his sermon, but they really stuck out at me because I've been on a quest to really find um, how Jesus worked. I, I really, I, I, you know, uh, if I'm to be like him, how was he? Um, what did he do? What did he say? How did he feel? And when I'm whining about, oh, I forgot something at the grocery store, I don't think Jesus did that. Now, I feel like right now I have a giant puzzle on the table, maybe like a a million pieces, and I'm trying to put it all together to find out as much as I can about Jesus, to get this full picture of who he was. Now, taking God for granted, and I think we live in a world where that is that is everywhere, taking God for granted, TVs, newspapers, everywhere you can imagine, God is just taken for granted. Um, John Piper shared this story where a man asked another man, uh, besides God, who's the most important person in your life? And he said the vice uh, president of marketing of his company. And the man said, not your wife? He says, well, yeah, I just assumed it was her. And John Piper made the point that we assume too much about God. We don't, we don't honor him. We take him for granted. So, God wants us to honor him. I mean, think about it. If you're a wife and you heard your husband say he thought more highly of somebody at his company where he works, or you'd be hurt. You'd be devastated. I mean, it should, I should be one of the most important people in my husband's life. So, we don't want to be indispensable we want to be treasured. We, and God's the same way. He doesn't want to be an afterthought like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, God, yeah, I, I think I remember him. God doesn't like to be taken for granted. Do you know that? He really doesn't. Um, so why is it important for us to value God, to not take him for granted? Well, think about this. He created all things, all things. Well, that's, that's saying something. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. That's in Hebrews 1, 3. Can you, can you do that? 
He changes times. He, he removes kings and establishes new kings. He does according to his will. That's in Daniel 4, 35. He knows all things. Do you know all things? Does your TV show know all things? Does the newspaper know all things? He, he knows all motives. He knows the causes for all motives. He knows the effect of all structures. He knows the effect of, of any kind of government on its people. He knows all things. He knows all secrets. He knows all possibilities. That's in Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. He is the only path to eternal life. Psalms 16, 11. He is all truth. I love this. All beauty and all goodness. That's in John 14, 16. So he, he does a lot. And that's just like a, a thumbnail list of what he does. You know, in, in Psalm 96, 4, it doesn't say great is the Lord and greatly to be taken for granted. It says great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. It says right in the scripture. Do everything to the glory of God. Everything. Even demons and angels will not take him for granted. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Nations, nations. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-seven to twenty-eight. Nations. You know, our country might think that it is doing what it wants, but really, it's all part of God's plan. So, don't take for granted nations. The Holy Spirit—that's a big one for me. John sixteen fourteen. I'm learning more and more to rely on the Holy Spirit, to cry out for the Holy Spirit, for guidance, for what should I do here? What should I do there? What should I say? What shouldn't I say? Um, Jesus didn't take God for granted. He talked to him constantly. What should I do, Father? God himself does not take himself for granted. Romans 9, 17. But you know what? We are surrounded in a world that takes God for granted. You can turn on TV. Do they ever have a minute where they said, let's honor God? You can turn on um, your radio. You can turn on, um, you can get out the newspaper and read. You know, there's sections on local news. There's sections on sports. There's a whole section on sports. Is there a whole section on God? No, absolutely not. You know, sometimes there's even evangelists who take God for granted. What they speak, what they do has no regard to God. Not at all. They might tell you how to become prosperous. They might tell you how to uh, be successful, how to be happy. While they live in a compound, their house is bigger than any house I know. You could... Probably had all the houses on my block to equal theirs. You know, Pastor and I have a little joke. When he goes and visits another pastor, the first thing I say to him is, what kind of house do they have? I, I feel like that's, that's, that's a visible sign of the heart of the pastor. If you live in a house, there's only a couple of you, and you live in a house, you could fit like a city. I don't, I don't think, think God appreciates that, but I could be wrong. So we're looking at where God is really um, taken for granted and we are surrounded. We are surrounded at your workplace. Is God taken for granted? At the grocery store, everywhere we go in this world, it hits us right in the face. So when the main thing is missing in a person, when I don't have Jesus in my life, I can become superficial. You know, this has always puzzled me. I've known Christians, or they say they're Christians, but when I look at them and I hear what they're saying, I'm confused, and I just feel like John Piper helped me with that. They're superficial. They don't have a deep, deep love for Jesus. Think about it. When a Christian can talk 
or write for days, hours, whatever, without including Jesus or God in there, there's, there's a defect. There's a major defect in that person. What can I do to change this? So right now, let's say I'm thinking, um, I, I, I don't feel, I don't think of God a lot. I don't even think about him daily, let alone hourly. Um, first of all, I would start by praying and, and admiring him, just telling him how much you really do admire him. He's incredible. How much you love him. You know, Anybody that is in a relationship likes to hear that they're loved and appreciated. And so does God. Treasure him. Treat him like he's the most important person in your life. Because he should be. Stand in awe of him. If we really thought about all that he has accomplished. Our minds should be open and alert and and fascinated by this God. God does not like being taken for granted. It robs him of glory. It robs me of joy. But when I glorify God, I become satisfied. I become satisfied. I know it because I've experienced those times. When I'm glorifying him, I'm worshiping him, and something in me changes. Something in me changes. So, you know, it's this to me, I just have to share this. This is funny because um, I asked my husband to give me some scriptures in Christ. Now, he has been speaking on in Christ. He spoke about in Christ before. He's covering it again in a new way. But in Christ, I love the picture he's given us, that you draw a circle on the floor. You're in Christ when you're in that circle, and you're empowered. You can do all things through Christ. When you step out of the circle, however, you are outside of Christ. So what you do is not including him, and he will not necessarily honor that. So I need, I have this visual now. So on my journey, I know that I need to be in Christ. I need to be in Christ. Last week, I learned that I need to worship him. I need to read the word to get drenched. My hope is in him to get drenched by the Holy Spirit. And I really do feel that's a key to being more like Jesus. Just getting on our knees, praying, um, worshiping him, and allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us up. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we overflow. That joy that comes in us overflows. And it reaches all sorts of people. It just, it can't be stopped. It's just flowing. People can step into it or people can run away from it, whatever, but it's out there. And I started thinking when I said, are you a sponge or are you a spring? A sponge doesn't move and it can get moldy and stinky if you think about it. But a spring is always fresh. It's always new. It's always reaching out. It doesn't contain itself. So we talked about last week, which one are you, a sponge or a spring? Now, this might be a little confusing to some people. We're all not called to be uh, uh, John the Baptist. We're all not. We have different personalities, and God has placed us in different places. But, you know, we still need to be aware and hooked into that Holy Spirit to know what we should be doing. You know, maybe you are a witness of Christ at your workplace because your smile and because of your tenderness and your love towards others. Maybe you're a witness of Christ because you can't stop talking about how he's a healer. Maybe you're um, an evangelist who can't stop talking about Christ because he saved and he brought you salvation. There's all different kinds of, of pictures of us in Christ. So anyway, have this great image now. God has got me on this path With that puzzle, putting it together, being more like Jesus, trying to find out like, well, why, why could he just touch people and heal them? And then I thought about moms would appreciate this. If we had that gift of healing and our kids came to us whining, I don't feel good. I don't want to go to school. You could just touch them and heal them and and they'd have to go to school. But anyway, um, 
and and then I thought about when you think about Martha and Mary, how you know they they sent a messenger to Jesus to um to come and heal their brother Lazarus who was dying, and he didn't come, and they were so crushed, they were so hurt, they didn't understand that his powers just weren't were in healing; they were also in in restoring life, which is really what it's all about, isn't it? He restored life to each one of us. So anyway, I said to my husband, you know, I do want to bring up um, scriptures in Christ. And I know I was looking at some and he's, he found, of course, uh, one in Ephesians chapter one. And it's it's long, of course, because I was looking for a short scripture and my husband would find a long scripture but in this long passage it's not that long really um i want you to see how important it is to be in christ so it starts with ephesians 3 i'm sorry ephesians 1 verse 3 blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So you want to receive those things, those spiritual blessings, you have to be in the circle with Christ. Just as he chose us in him, you have to be in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now notice that to acquire these things, we have to be in Christ, in him, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. We need grace, don't we? By which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him, again, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things, what in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him... You also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What a great phrase. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchase possession to the praise of his glory? I'm going to stop there. And I underlined all those in Christ, in him, in the beloved, with pencil. I just went back. I think I'm going to go over in ink so that when I read this, I will remember that I don't want to take God for granted. When I read this passage, all the things he did for me, all the things from the very beginning, even before I was born. Do you realize that even before you were born, God had you in Christ? That's incredible. He prayed over you. He loved you. We need to do the same for him. So don't take God for granted. In our world, it's so easy to. There's so many distractions. And I know a lot of you work, and it's hard just to um, pray all day. And But you know what? I found that I can pray in my car on my way to work. I can pray definitely on my way home, which I probably need. And during the day, there are moments I just capture Jesus. I see him. Where do I see him? Well, maybe I see him in a little child skipping down the hallway. Or I look out my window and I see a a sun shining on trees. God is there. He did all things. So 
and the, you know, and what to me is so incredible is that he died for us. He was, if you think about it, he was the God of the universe. He was the God who created all things. And yet he was willing to die for us. And he even knew before he created us that that would be part of the plan. So when we take communion today, we need to remember um, how much he loves us, how much he really loves us, and that we hurt him when we take him for granted. So today, may we start not taking him for granted. May we just thank him and appreciate him and think about his goodness, his love, his mercy, his grace. Because if it wasn't for his grace, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. We wouldn't deserve anything we have. So Jesus, again, thank you for your body. Thank you for pouring out your blood. Thank you for doing all things for us. Because you love us more than we can ever imagine. You take us to a level we could never go ourselves. Lord, may we not take you for granted this day. May we may all your actions and your words and your love unfold before us today may we sob in appreciation of what you did for us dear god thank you jesus thank you thank you thank you that we can say we're in christ and you suffered an incredible death painful death sorrowful death but you did it for us lord when you ask us to do things i pray that we have the stamina to walk the walk lord Help us, Lord, with baby steps. Help us to just do the little things, Lord. Help us to see you everywhere, hear you everywhere, and answer you everywhere. May we become lights in a dark world, dear Jesus. May we become lights. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Well, we are going to have um, online Sunday school. Uh, those of you that have been attending, you already know what to do. Those of you that would like to join the Sunday school, you haven't been on yet. I'm going to try this again. Go to www.lhcf.warn.org. Warn.org. Dot com. I knew I'd mess it up. Okay, here it is. LHCF.warn slash Sunday school. Okay. I knew I'd mess it up. You know I do that every Sunday, but it's kind of, maybe it's keeping you on your toes, right? I don't know. So anyway, uh, here we are, and um, I appreciate all of you. I really do. Um, I love all of you, especially a certain person that tuned in today. It's really dear to my heart. So anyway, thank you. And I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Mike. And uh, and I want you to notice that um, my dog is here, and he is the pastor of all fur, fur babies in our church. So he always is here and um, contributing. So thank you very much. Good morning. Well, this will be our third consecutive week uh, dealing with Colossians chapter 1. Two weeks ago, we spoke about the significance of verses 1 through 23, the resurrection of Christ, the work of God in Christ, the life that Christ imparts to us through the gospel. Colossians 1, 1 through 23 is what Christ has done for the church. Verses 24 through 29 which we started to look at last week, Paul then shifts gears slightly and begins to talk about the purpose of his apostolic ministry. Now, week number one, we talked about those 23 verses, the purpose of the gospel. Last week, we tied together those first 23 verses with verse 24, making a connection between the purpose of the gospel and the purpose of apostolic ministry. This week, we want to focus on verses 24 through 29, which deal with the purpose of apostolic ministry. I 
mention to my leadership team that this week in particular is for them. It's about leadership in the body of Christ. It's for all of us, of course. It's the Word of God, but there's a special emphasis on leadership. So I told my leadership team, make sure to have listened to the previous two weeks, listen to this week. Well, I can tell you in just preparing for the the, the message this morning, it's pretty doubtful uh, that I will finish verses 24 through 29 this week. Uh, in, in particular, as I as I began looking at it, verses 24, 124 through 2, 5, chapter 2, verse 5, is really a, a, a single unit where Paul lays this out. And so we'll probably end up spending a couple weeks on Paul's apostolic ministry. So for that, I will tell my church, not only these the previous two weeks, but this week and as many weeks as it takes to finish this. So we did look at verse 24 last week, uh, and we'll start off with that verse again. Paul actually, um, let's close up the first section by just reading over briefly. Um, verse. Let's start with verse 21, just to kind of get that context. Paul says, and you, and he's referring to the church in Colossae, and you who were alienated and hostile in your mind through wicked works, in wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. Previously, he was talking about the ministry of Christ to reconcile all things to himself. And now he's talking about those who were once enemies of the Lord are reconciled to the Lord. And he reconciled us by removing us from being in wicked works to being in Christ, as Pastor Jan discussed in this morning's message. Yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. Now he's talking about that Jesus' broken body, Jesus' crucified body, Jesus' buried body. This was the means that the Lord used to reconcile those who were once enemies with the Lord to now become members of his family and members of his church. Uh, he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach, to present us holy without blemish and blameless uh, in his sight. Now notice the term used to present you. Now in the Old Testament, normally an Israelite would present a sacrifice to God so that the Israelite who because of sin and because of uncleanness had been separated from God could now be reconciled to God and could once again partake of Levitical worship, the worship of all of God's people in his presence. The normal sense of presenting something is uh, a, a sinner an Israelite would present a sacrifice to the Lord. Well, in, in this verse, Paul takes that same imagery of presenting something to God and switches it around, is that now Jesus presents us to God because of his death, we now can be reconciled to him. Now, that's one level of presentation. Jesus presenting us to God. And Paul will talk later on in this apostolic ministry that God has called him into. If we look at verse 28, verse 28, Paul is talking about Christ. Him we preach, we, we, we uh, announce Jesus, we proclaim Jesus, warning every man or admonishing every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man mature in Christ Jesus. There's, a, there's that idea of everything that takes place is done in Christ. Christ presents us to the Father in himself, in Christ, as an acceptable offering. That's what 
brings justification to us. That's what brings healing to us. That's what brings a reconciliation with God. That's what brings us into uh, becoming part of the family of God as, as, as being able to see God as father and, and, and we're his children and we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And then Paul talks about then apostolic ministry. This is the, the purpose of leadership in the body of Christ. The, the purpose of leadership in the body of Christ is not salvific. It doesn't have to do with salvation. Jesus takes care of salvation. But leadership deals with the church becoming mature, the church entering into the fullness of God's purposes on earth. It, it, it's, it's eschatological, the, the, the purpose behind leadership, apostolic leadership, pastoral leadership, prophetic leadership, the leadership of teachers and evangelists in the body of Christ, governmental leadership of, of elders and, and uh, bishops, overseers. That purpose is eschatological. We, we are to cause the church to mature into the full stature of Christ as Ephesians 4 uh, talks about. We are, we, are, we are coming into the fullness of Christ. The purpose of leadership now is then to present the church mature. We have to understand that entering into the purposes of God are both salvific and eschatological. Salvific, it has to do with individual salvation. Eschatological has to do with the church as the church becoming mature and becoming that testimony to Jesus in the earth by what we say, by what we do, by how we live, by what our lives represent. Those are eschatological purposes, bearing witness to Christ. And Paul speaks of that now as leaders in turn then take the church over which the Lord places them and offers a mature church unto the Lord, presents that. So, 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 so we see this sequence taking place here. We go back to the 22nd verse. He has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present us holy, without blemish, and blameless in his sight. That's through the righteousness of Christ we become holy. Through the righteousness of Christ we are declared by the Lord to be without blemish before the Father. And in the righteousness of Christ we are blameless. We take upon ourselves his righteousness. If, indeed, you continue, verse 23 says, in faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. And then Paul declares himself a minister. Now, we, we looked at two words for minister, uh, earlier in in Ephesians in Ephes- or e- earlier in Colossians one here, Epaphras is called a be- beloved bond servant in unity with us, and he's also called a faithful servant of Christ. There are there are at least three levels of service that we see in the New Testament. One level of service has to do with our devotion to Christ. That's what it means to be a bond servant. We must first and foremost be devoted to Christ. Second, we are ministering service. We're bond slaves slash devoted servants to Christ, our master, Christ alone. Second, we are ministering service servants where we provide grace, where we provide teaching, where we provide serving where we provide insight, where we provide impartation, ministry, as we would call it. The same Greek word is for servant here and ministry. A, a, one who is a servant of the Lord is one who ministers the life of God to others. And there's a third, third word which we may see 
uh, in another passage today, a, a third aspect to ministry. But just as Paul called Epaphras in that verse in Colossians 1, 7, a bondservant and a faithful minister, a faithful servant, Paul now attributes the same terminology to himself. It was proclaimed, this gospel was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now, the apostolic ministry, we said apostolic ministry, the purpose of apostolic ministry is to impart encouragement, comfort, strength, grace, teaching, admonition. It's to impart these things to the church to create disciples who then walk in the mission of the Lord according to the vision of the Lord to establish the purposes of the Lord for the church. Impartation is the key to apostolic ministry here that Paul is referring to. So he says he is a, he is a, a servant of the church at the end of verse 23, and then in verse 24 he says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up the things that are lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body, which is the church, and he says it again, of which I became a minister. He says in verse 23, he's a minister, a servant of the church. He says in verse 25, he's a minister or a servant uh, of the church, a servant of the Lord. And verse 24 describes the main purpose of that ministry. It is to fill up things that are lacking, lacking concerning the afflictions of Christ in his flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now, I want you to notice the reason I, I reiterated those verses 21, 22, and 23. 21, 22, and 23 talks about what Jesus imparted to the church in his flesh, what Jesus imparted to his body in his flesh through his death, and those are salvific things. He did all those things in his flesh. Now, Paul is going to talk about what he, as an apostolic leader, is going to impart to the church in his flesh, in, in, in his own body. And, and Paul says, just as Jesus imparted what he imparted to us and imparts everything that he's imparted to us through his death, Paul says that the key to impartation for a, an apostolic leader is going to be through suffering. Death and suffering being parallel ideas in terms of Jesus' work and the church's work in Christ. So there, there, Paul is setting up a parallel. As Christ was to the church for the purposes of salvation, apostolic leaders are to be to the church for impartation for maturity. Now see, this, this speaks of being co-workers with Christ. Paul talks about his co-workers, his co-laborers, other members of his apostolic team, other leaders in the church and the body of Christ but, but he, he's speaking here about also being a co-worker with Jesus. And it means, what that means is that when we are in Christ, the Lord not only brings us into individual blessing and healing and strength that we need for ourselves and for our salvation and for our sanctification, but the Lord brings us into Christ that the church might be matured. And, and by being brought into Christ to help the church mature, the Lord allows the church to participate in the establishment of his kingdom purposes. It is not unfair to say that the church 
helps complete the work of Christ, helps complete the ministry of Christ. Now, we don't help complete it apart from Christ. We don't help to complete it instead of Christ. We help to complete it by being co-laborers with Christ. He allows us in Christ to participate in his purposes. Now, I mentioned last week, there are four aspects to impartation. And this section is so important because it's, it's the fourth aspect and it's, it's very significant and very important. We said the first aspect is seen in Colossians 1, 3. Paul gives thanks. Leaders give thanks to the Lord. It's a four-step process to impart maturity to the church. First of all, we give thanks to the Lord. The, the leader, has his life has to be right with the Lord to begin with. And see, thanksgiving is, is a clear sign. Giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Giving thanks to the Lord, being thankful, is a clear-cut sign that a leader's life is right with Christ. When they knew him as God but did not glorify him as God, neither were they thankful. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, sin is imparted in the earth. Sin is promulgated in the earth. Sin is manifest in the earth. Sin increases in the earth. Sin expands its, its reign of death in the earth. Knowing God as God and not glorifying him as God and not being thankful is the source of death in the earth. It's what causes death to spread. Thankfulness, giving thanks to the Lord for he is good, for he is beautiful, for everything he does is glorious and marvelous and wonderful. Giving thanks to the Lord for he is good because his steadfast love endures forever, is the first step in impartation. The leader himself must be right with the Lord. The second step is proclaiming Christ. The proclamation of the gospel, the declaration of the gospel. Paul speaks in Colossians 1 in these previous verses about proclaiming the truth, proclaiming the, the graciousness graciousness of God in Christ, proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the preeminence of Christ. The second step is proclaiming. The third step, not necessarily in this order, because verse 3 talks about not only do we give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we pray for you always. It's really thanksgiving, then prayer, then proclamation. But, you know, God is, is an interest in all the time in the order in which things take place, as long as we get all of those things there. Praying is part of the impartation process. So a spirit of thanks, giving and worship, prayer for the saints, proclaiming the word to the saints. Three parts of impartation. But Paul now, as he examines his apostolic ministry in greater detail. Verse 24, I rejoice in my suffering for you and I impart the things which are lacking. See, suffering is the key. The fourth part, the missing piece of, of the puzzle. Jan's puzzle in, in her message had a thousand pieces. This puzzle has four pieces. And see, it is suffering. It is through it's through Jesus' suffering that he imparted grace and life to us, that he reconciled us to God, that he justified us, that he delivered us. It's, it's through his death. And see, it, the key to participating in the establishment of the Lord's kingdom purposes in human history, the key is suffering releases worship, what has been declared in worship what has been prayed for in intercession and what has been proclaimed in our declarations. Suffering releases that impartation to the church. Now notice Paul says, and I mentioned this last week, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. 
It's not just suffering. Everybody suffers. Everybody in the world suffers. It's not about pain. It's not about random suffering. People suffer and get embittered. People suffer and, and, and create an, an, an idol to their pain. People suffer and they go out and they shoot people and they kill people. It's not just about suffering. Everyone suffers. It's Christological suffering is what we mentioned last week. It is the suffering in Christ. It's finding Christ in suffering. It's rejoicing in suffering. And remember this idea of rejoicing. To rejoice means to to act out joyfully and to act out gracefully. The same Greek word for rejoice, which is kairo, is the source of both the Greek word kara, which is joy, and charis, which is grace. To rejoice is to, to walk in joy and to walk in grace, or to walk in grace-formed joy. And the only way that suffering can, can go along with rejoicing is if it's Christological suffering, if we find Christ in the midst of a situation. I had a brother who, uh, a younger brother in the Lord, who is counseling someone else about their um, horrible history of, of abuse. Uh, this is someone who's just recently come to the Lord and, and experienced significant abuse in his childhood. And we were discussing about how might I, I help this, this individual to forgive? Well, and, and one of the questions was, are there any stories, uh, biblical stories that you can recommend uh, in terms of someone who had to learn to forgive uh, abuse, forgive a uh, terrible injustice done uh, to him or her by the members of, of his own family? And of course, instantly, Joseph came to mind. And see, Joseph, his brothers sold him into slavery. His brothers left him for dead. Some wanted to murder him. Some wanted to just leave him for dead. Some wanted to sell him into slavery. The, the net effect was the same. He was forcibly, unjustly removed from his family, taken as a slave into Egypt, thrown into prison into Egypt, suffers all kind of injustice, but then from a place of imprisonment, gets connected to the very ruler, the pharaoh of Egypt, who has a, a, a dream that needs interpreting, and Joseph gives him the divine interpretation. And once Pharaoh hears the correct interpretation, he appoints Joseph as his right-hand man to help carry out the interpretation, which was how to prepare for this great famine that was going to hit the world. So Joseph's brothers eventually come to Egypt looking for help from the famine. They don't know it's Joseph. Joseph does some things uh, with them, but the point is, is Joseph forgives his brothers for what they did. And of course, the, the famous statement in Genesis 50 is, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. See, that's Christological suffering. Joseph found Christ in the injustice that had taken place in his life, in the suffering in the harm, in the calamity, in the abuse that took place in his life, he found Christ. That's Christological suffering. And see, Paul, everything for Paul is Christological. What, when Paul is writing this in 124, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, Paul is writing from prison. He's been imprisoned for the sake of the gospel. And instead of saying, why is this happening to me? Uh, I'm going to send out a prayer letter. Everybody pray that I get out of jail. And Paul wasn't against getting out of jail by any means. But Paul, first of all, said, Lord, what is your purpose? Where are you in this? And the Lord says, you're suffering to impart something that's lacking in the churches that you've established. When Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you, He's not just talking about the Colossian church. He's talking about all of his churches, all of the churches that Paul established apostolically. Paul recognized 
that the great suffering that he experienced, the great suffering he experienced was to impart grace for maturity for the churches he had established. In other words, just establishing the church wasn't his apostolic purpose. Just getting people saved isn't the fullness of God's purposes. Just getting people to heaven isn't the fullness of God's purpose. Just getting people whole and healthy and into their personal individual destiny is not establishing the full purposes of God. Causing the church to become the church and to rise up as a witness and a testimony in their unity, in their understanding of Christ, in their proclamation of the gospel, just not only by their words, but by their lives together with each other. That's the purpose. And Paul understood these churches were planted, and now that they've been planted and established, then it's his job to bring this maturity, to present every person mature in Christ. And what hinders maturity in the body of Christ is that an inability of the church to suffer, an inability of the church to participate in what he calls the afflictions of Christ. Christ established God's purposes and imparted God's grace and brought people into God's family and brought people into Christ and healed and transformed people's lives to be like Christ through suffering. Suffering is the means. Now, the apostle suffers that a church might become mature. And what does a mature church look like? Well, it's a church of disciples who then now they've received the impartation through the suffering of the leadership. Now they in turn can suffer for others and extend discipleship in the body of Christ. It's leaders raising leaders who suffer and impart grace through their suffering, raising up disciples who can suffer and impart God's grace to others through suffering. And a church that is lacking of the afflictions of Christ is going to lack in that ability to impart the grace needed for the church to become mature. When, when, when we are looking at the current American situation, the political situation, we want this candidate, we want that candidate. All right, we need to ask ourselves this question. Do we want this candidate and that candidate to alleviate suffering in our own lives? That's, that's possible. There's nothing wrong with wanting unjust, ungodly suffering in people's lives to be alleviated. But we, but we also have to understand the sovereignty of God. We have to understand that the Lord puts in leadership whom he wills. Acts chapter 17 says he determines the times and the boundaries of nations. And those times and boundaries are established by the Lord for his purposes to take place in those nations. Let, let, let me suggest something to you here. Um, the early church was a marginalized society that nonetheless rejoiced in the hope of the gospel, that nonetheless practiced love, that nonetheless walked in faith and power, that, that saw the centrality of justice for all. The early church was a marginalized society, and the power that was in that society eventually overcame the persecution in the Roman Empire against the church, and Rome bent the knee to Christianity. Christianity didn't bend the knee to Rome. Now, whatever that means for us in present-day America, we need to understand it's in the power of the gospel that the political systems of the world, the political systems of the earth, will bend the knee. This is, this is the kingdom of the world becoming the kingdom of our God 
and of his Christ, Revelation chapter 11. But suffering was the key to the early church. We understand that suffering remains the key to the earlier, to, to, to the, the current church. Now, we, we, we want to see something else that, that, that Paul is talking about here. Paul is talking about uh, filling up what is lacking of the afflictions of Christ in his body. He's talking about a lack and he's talking about an impartation for that lack. That is what is the purpose of the, the church. That is what the purpose of leadership is in the church. That's how discipleship, real biblical discipleship is formed by thanksgiving in the life of the leader. The leader prays for the church to be built up and strengthened and made whole. The leader proclaims the truth to the church. Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, I have not refrained from declaring to you the full counsel of God. In other words, Paul put truth first. He always proclaimed the truth. And because he proclaimed the truth, that truth helped to impart a vision for the mission of the Lord in the churches he founded. Fourth, of course, we suffer. Now, let's let's look at it. Let's go to the book that uh, just before Colossians. Go to go to Philippians, chapter three. Similar language here in Philippians three as we have in Colossians one. When Paul is talking about filling up what is lacking of the sufferings of Christ. Paul says in verse 7 of Philippians 3, what things were gain to me, these I've counted loss for Christ. Anything that was gain to me, for me, I consider it loss for Christ. In other words, I'm not going to let anything get in the way of my apostolic imperative, my apostolic call, that's going to hinder Christ from being manifested powerfully in the church, from causing the church to grow into an authentic demonstration of what it means to be the body of Christ. As the body of Christ, we are his representatives in the earth. What things were gained to me, these I've counted lost for Christ. Paul is going to show us again in, in somewhat different imagery how to suffer for Christ, how to fill up what is lacking in the church. He says, yet indeed I count all things loss. I count all things as loss for the sake of the excellent thing known as the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He sees this revelation of Jesus' person as being the most excellent thing in his life. And because it's the most excellent thing, everything else pales in comparison to him. And he's not just talking about, I'm giving up the bad things in my life. He's saying the good things in my life are second to Christ. Good things are still good things and we need to embrace them and increase them. Bad things are still bad things and we need to separate ourselves from them. But none compares to the most excellent thing, the most excellent way, and that is this revelation knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. For whom I have sustained the loss of all things and consider them rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. Now in Colossians 1, the mystery of Christ has to do with Jew and Gentile being joined together in one. But there's also the element of Christ himself being the mystery. And in other words, Christ is so intimately connected with his people that the revelation of him, the revelation of himself, is also a revelation of his body. And his body, that's this intimate union and connection that Christ has. In Christ, we also find this union with Christ 
where he becomes the head and we become the body. We are in complete union with him. And so Paul can talk about Christ being the mystery, but he can also talk about diverse people being united in Christ as being part of the mystery as well. But right here, Paul talks about gaining Christ. In Colossians, he talks about gaining this this unity in Christ between Jew and non-Jew among various ethnic groups. He says, and I repeat, I've suffered the loss of all things. I count them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, be found in Christ. There's that whole idea of stepping into the circle, be found in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is the righteousness of the law. Paul, his scripture was the old covenant scriptures. He was a a zealot in the Mosaic law, he, he claims actually in this passage he, he surpassed all his fellow Jews in the righteousness of the Mosaic law, something that Paul did and something that Paul could stand before the Lord and say, look at me, I, what I've accomplished for you. But he said he realized that that would stop him from gaining Christ. If we value anything in our lives more than Christ, that becomes an obstacle to gaining Christ. It becomes an obstacle to winning Christ. It becomes an obstacle to knowing Christ. It becomes an obstacle to, to bringing maturity into the church. It becomes an obstacle for the eschatological purposes of the Lord in human history. And Paul had to come to a place, and this is what he's trying to say. He says, the thing that meant the most to me was my righteousness according to the law of Moses. And he said, well, if that was gain to me, I had to put that aside. I had to let it go. I had to drop it from my hands in order that I might gain Christ. And we, we need to ask ourselves as Christians today, What do we hold in our hands as of greatest, most excellent value to ourselves? We need need to ask ourselves that question. If it's not Christ, then it's a hindrance to gaining Christ. He says that I would be found in him, in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is the righteousness of the law, but the righteousness that is on account of the faithfulness of Christ. Some translations um, speak of faith in Christ as being it's, it's our faith in Christ objectively that wins for us Christ and that gets us his righteousness. But the construction of th- this particular terminology in the Greek, this particular phraseology, is the faithfulness of Christ. See, My righteousness is founded in the faithfulness of Christ. See, it is his death, his suffering that brings me into Christ and everything then that is of Christ is mine, including his suffering. And when when we find that his suffering is our suffering, just as his righteousness is our righteousness, just as his desire to to be obedient to the Father is our desire to be obedient to the Father. Just as his infilling with the Spirit without measure is the same as our infilling of the Spirit without measure. If we are in Christ and we're bearing witness to Christ and we're suffering for Christ and we're praying in Christ and we're proclaiming the word of the Lord in Christ and we're giving thanks to God in Christ, then the Lord is 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 making Christ the prize and he's giving us all that we need to impart maturity in the church. And it's all because of the faithfulness of Christ. It's the faithfulness that we obtain in Christ. It's his faithfulness being imparted to us, which is, the righteousness of God that's on the basis of faith. See, his faithfulness, 
releases grace to give me a basis for my faith, to place my faith in Christ. It's his faithfulness. Paul is saying the order is the faithfulness of Christ leads to a righteousness which is from God on the basis of faith. Now, I can walk in faith because of his faithfulness. And see, this is how Paul rejoices in his suffering. It's Christological rejoicing. It's Christological suffering because the basis of everything is his relationship with the Lord. And it is out of his relationship with the Lord that he overflows to provide what is lacking in the rest of the church. And he says that the purpose of this faith is that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. There's Colossians 1, verses 1 through 23, the power of his resurrection is everything that is granted to the church in verses 1 through 23. To know him in the power of his resurrection and we not only know the power of his resurrection, but we know the fellowship or the sharing in his sufferings being made conformable to his death. All right, back to uh, Colossians chapter 1. Now, we need to spend a, a, a few minutes in the Old Testament understanding. This term, the afflictions of Christ, is drawn from the Old Testament. The Old Testament talked about the afflictions of the Messiah, the tribulation of the Messiah, the tribulation that the Messiah would experience. And I want to go to Daniel 7. We talk a lot about Daniel 7, but this is, this is a, a, a picture uh, of Daniel 7. Paul is drawing off the imagery in Daniel chapter 7. This is what it means when Paul says, I'm rejoicing in my sufferings on behalf of the church, and I'm filling up what's lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body, the church. The Lord wants us to participate in corporate solidarity with the Lord with each other in the afflictions of Christ, in the sufferings of Christ, to fulfill the word of God, to establish the mystery of Christ in the earth, to bring the church into maturity. Here, here's, here's what we're seeing here in Daniel 7. And keep in mind what we're talking about, this image of solidarity, with Christ that we see in Daniel 7 and this issue of being co-laborers with the Lord in establishing his kingdom purposes in the earth and as members of the church completing the work of God in the earth. Now, we've talked a lot about Daniel 7. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to I'm going to summarize uh the first um 11 verses. Four great empires, political entities, historical political entities. First Babylon, followed by Persia, followed by Greece, followed by Rome. Each empire took over the previous empire and their dominance of the earth, their political and governmental and military and economic and philosophical dominance of the earth was birthed out of their becoming the conquering nation, the conquering empire, the dominant empire in the earth. And they all come before the ancient of days. They come into a throne room situation. And remember, the throne room is also a place of legal enactments because the king is, is both, uh, he has executive power and judicial power in these uh, ancient Near Eastern scenarios. We separate in America the executive power from the judicial power, <clears throat> but it wasn't so in the, in the ancient world. And all of these empires, are they want the approval of the ancient days. They want divine approval to say that we have the final and ultimate say in the earth. Well, of course, the Lord rejects Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. He just says they're just political entities. I'm in control of them. Uh, I'm in control of human history. I use nations. I raise them up and I bring them down. 
so that my purposes are accomplished in the earth. And then the Son of Man appears. And the Son of Man, of course, is Jesus. It's, it's the, the, the Old Testament figure of the Messiah. The Son of Man appears. And verse 13 says, I saw in the night visions, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. Daniel seven thirteen. he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one which shall not be destroyed. The Son of Man is given ultimate authority to establish God's kingdom purposes in human history. That's an eschatological purpose. I'm not talking about a salvific purpose here, primarily an eschatological purpose. You have to save people to establish God's kingdom, but the establishment of God's kingdom comes along with the salvific purposes. So Daniel, you know, he sees this vision. He doesn't, doesn't get it. He doesn't understand it. He's disturbed. And so he asks, there's a heavenly being there. He's in heaven witnessing this. There's a heavenly being next to him. And he asks the, um, the heavenly being, what, what are these four beasts? Who's the son of man? What, what's going on? And verse 17, the interpreter says, these four great beasts are four kingdoms that shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. It's as if he bypasses the Son of Man and goes right to the saints. Now the Son of Man received the kingdom, but the interpreter says the saints of the Most High, because the saints of the Most High, see the church, the saints of the Most High, those who are immersed in the Lord's steadfast love, those who are the holy ones of the Lord, which Jesus, through his death, presents us as saints, as holy, as without blemish, as blameless before him. Paul calls the church the saints four times in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, and, and just Colossians 1, and I believe the early part of Colossians 2, he calls us the saints because, again, he's aligning his thinking of God's eschatological purposes from a new covenant perspective in Christ with Daniel 7. The saints, do you understand? As the church, we are a holy nation. Now, we're, we don't have a representation at the United Nations, but when God looks at the world, he sees Russia, he sees China, he sees Saudi Arabia, he sees South Africa, he sees Brazil, he sees Mexico, he sees China, he sees Japan, he sees Australia, he sees the United States, and he sees the church. The church is a political entity. The church, as the church, with the unity of all of God's people from all the nations of the earth, and that's why our solidarity must be to our ultimate nation before the empire of our residence. A Christian is supposed to have greater allegiance and solidarity with the church than with any nation. America, China, whatever your nation is, as a church, you are the saints of the Most High, the holy ones of the Most High, the chesed ones of the Most High, those who are immersed in his steadfast love first, and you are a resident of your empire second, the resident of the empire in which you live second. There are four kingdoms that shall arise from the earth, verse 18, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Now, the fourth beast is the one that stood out to Daniel. He saw the first three beasts. He's actually living through beast number one and beast number two. He was brought into exile by the Babylonians, and the Persians would set them free from exile and send them back to their land. Daniel lived under those two. He wouldn't have necessarily understood the third beast, which was Greece, which would be future for him. But the fourth beast, which is the most bizarre and the most powerful and the one that's most significantly emphasized in Daniel 7, that one caught his attention. Now, there's a reason why it does. Because Jesus is going to be born under the fourth beast, Rome. Everything in the New Testament is about Rome, including the book of Revelation. Remember, four beasts become a composite single beast 
in Revelation 13. Revelation 13, the beast is the Roman Empire. It's a composite, but it's the fourth empire. And it's because Jesus is going to go into direct conflict. It's going to be Rome that's going to crucify him in, in unity with apostate Jews. But he's, 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 uh, Daniel's attention is caught by this fourth beast. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head, it's just this beast and has ten horns, and horns always speak of military strength, political power. There were ten horns on its head, and there was another horn that came up and before which three of them fell, like a, there were ten horns and three are displaced by a single horn. That's how political power works. Political power, even when it's in the midst of ten horns, wants to dominate itself. When you have a Caesar who wants to dominate Rome, when you have a political party that wants to dominate America, when you have a presidential candidate that wants to dominate in America, that's a single horn trying to establish itself over even the entire nation. Idolatrous nations create idolatrous leaders. So this one horn, he, he's, he's fascinated by this one horn uh, that came up and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, and that seemed greater than its companions. Now, here, here, here we're trying to understand the afflictions of the Messiah. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Now, the Son of Man gets the kingdom and it's his dominion that's going to be established in the earth, as verse 14 says. But then it's the saints, the people of the Most High, who enter into war, who enter into war. This is called, when, when the rabbis taught the afflictions of the Messiah, which is the term Paul is using in Colossians 1, that the church is lacking in the afflictions of the Messiah, the church is lacking in participating, it's that the church doesn't understand it is in a battle for the kingdom of God with the powers that exist in the earth. The church is. The rabbis taught that Daniel 7, 21 through 27 described the afflictions of the Messiah. Messiah gets the kingdom and then he and his people experience suffering. They experience resistance from the existing powers. Let's continue. This Horn makes war with the saints and prevails over them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. It's this affliction, it's this warfare, it's this trouble. Paul is saying as an apostolic leader, through my sufferings I impart grace for the church to be matured. And what does it mean for the church to be matured? For the saints to possess the kingdom to walk in the Lord's kingdom authority in the earth, to walk in the power of the gospel, to walk in the, the, the ability to intercede and your prayers come to pass, to give thanksgiving to God and to bring the nations of the earth into that worship and thanksgiving of the Lord as the true Lord. That's the great commission. Go make disciples of all the nations. Verse 23, thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and he shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall seek to wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change time and law. Remember the when nations are given, it's their times and their boundaries. That's the law of God that he establishes. Well, nations, 
They don't want to submit to God. They want to be God. They want to have the ultimate authority in the earth. And so they seek to change the Lord's decree in heaven. And they shall be given into his hand for a time of times and half a time. Political powers, dark powers, cosmic powers, demonic powers, powers against the church and against the gospel can always look for a time and a season like they're making the church bend the knee to them. See, Rome for a time, the church appeared to bend the knee to them, but Rome ended up bending the knee to the church. But the court shall sit in judgment, and the dominion of this fourth beast will be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. Just as the early church faced this time of suffering and affliction from all the powers that opposed the gospel in their lifetime, but they overcame, so so has the church through its history, and so do we now in this hour. This is what it means to partake in the sufferings of the Messiah. We suffer for him that his dominion and his kingdom will be established in human history. We exercise hope and faith in him. We walk in love. And Paul is saying a church unwilling to suffer stops this process from going forth. All right, that's that's one way to look at this. Let's, instead of going back to Colossians, let's go to Revelation chapter 6. Go with me to Revelation chapter 6. The fifth seal. Now remember, the key term in Revelation, where Paul Paul talks in terms of maturity. The book of Revelation talks in terms of testimony, bearing witness. The the maturity of the church is that the church rises up in a corporate solidarity to bear witness to the Lord. Remember, before we go to Revelation 6, remember in Revelation 7, verse 9, when John goes to heaven, he sees in verse 9, after these things I look, this is 7, 9, of Revelation, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. See, this this solidarity of the church, the body of Christ, is all peoples, tongues, tribes, and nations, which are mentioned after, by the way, 144,000 in the previous verses in chapter 7 from the tribe of Israel. It's a unity between Jewish believers and non-Jewish believers from every ethnicity, every tribe, every people group, all coming together and declaring in testimony to the Lord, salvation belongs to the Lamb. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Now, if we look at the fifth seal that is is, is broken in Revelation 6, let's read it, 6, 9, just a couple verses. When he, that's Jesus, the Lamb, opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. Paul is going to talk about in Colossians 1, 25, and I'm filling up what's lacking in the body of Christ in terms of these sufferings of the Messiah that the church is going to press into the kingdom and bear witness to the kingdom and establish the kingdom in human history through suffering, but through suffering Christologically, rejoicing in suffering, that the word of God might be fulfilled. That's Colossians 1.25. What does it mean that the word of God be fulfilled? Well, he sees under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they bore. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you vindicate 
and judge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, were completed. See, this is the, this is the, the afflictions of the Messiah, also known as the birth pangs of the Messiah. Through suffering, the kingdom of God is established. These are people in the early church and people throughout the history of the church who consider the loss of all things gain to win Christ. What's the ultimate loss? My own life. Skin for skin, a man will give everything for his life. To bear witness to Christ is to be a martyr. Now, remember, bearing witness to Christ, when you're bearing witness to Christ with your life, in your church, in your proclamation, in your worship, in your suffering, you don't have to physically die to be a martyr. When you're bearing witness to Christ, you are a martyr. That's the, the Greek word for witness. You're bearing witness to him, and that's what we're called to do with Christ. But the ultimate manifestation of martyrdom is that we ultimately give our lives. But see, when you're suffering Christologically, you are giving your life for Christ. You're just saying Christ is more important than what I'm going through. I know that what I'm going through right now as a leader in the body of Christ is going to bring the church into maturity. It's going to impart grace for the church to rise up and become everything it's called to become. Now, on our way back to Colossians 1, visit Galatians chapter 4. Paul is saying the same things in Galatians 4 as he is in Colossians 1. Galatians 4.19, Paul calls the Galatian church, which he had established, was one of the churches uh, under his apostolic oversight. Galatians 4.19, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. What does it mean for Christ to be formed in us? That we partake of the afflictions of the Messiah, also known as the birth pangs of the Messiah. The Messiah is birthing something. He's birthing a saved people, a justified people, a healed people, an empowered people, a sanctified people, to be a corporate people, the church, who bears witness to the Lord in the earth and helps to establish his kingdom purposes in human history. Remember, in the labor that takes place in birth, there's pain. All right, going back to Colossians 1, and we'll finish uh, at least uh, with a brief summary of the rest of these verses. When Paul is filling up through his suffering the things that are lacking in the afflictions of Christ, he's experiencing the pain of childbirth. And he continues and he says, I do this on the behalf of, of uh, in my flesh, on behalf of his body, which is the church. In verse 25, he says again, of which I became a minister, a servant, according to the commission of God, the commission of God, which was given to me for you to fill up the word of God, to fulfill the word of God. What does it mean to fulfill the word of God? It means to fulfill the purposes of the gospel. Paul's been talking about the purposes of the gospel. To fulfill the word of God means to fulfill the purposes that the word of God has set in motion in Christ. Death, resurrection, ascension, release of the spirit, and raising up of saved, born again, justified individuals who also are the church. He continues, and this is what fulfilling the word of God is, the mystery which was hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his what? His saints, Daniel 7, and to whom it's these saints. Now, it's, Paul's talking about fulfilling the word of God has to do with this revelation of a, a mystery that was hidden, a sacred secret, a purpose hidden in God but is now revealed, made tangible and real in Christ. And God willed to make known, he willed 
to make it known. It's his will to make it known to the saints, to the church, the riches of the glory of this mystery among the nations. Now, the mystery here is it, it's going to be Christ, but it's going to have something to do with the nations. It's going to have something to do with Revelation chapter 7. It's going to have something to do with Matthew 28 and the Great Commission. Go make disciples of all nations. This mystery among the nations, and the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, the mystery is Christ but it's not just Christ. It's Christ in you. Now, you got to understand something about the Greek. That's the preposition N with a plural word after it. In you doesn't mean the hope of glory isn't Christ in me as an individual, although Christ does come into us as individuals when we're born again. It's Christ in us. All of you. And when you have N with a plural word after it, it means in your midst. The hope of glory is Christ among you. Christ in your midst. The hope of glory. The mystery is that Christ is among the nations of the earth. He has come to dwell. Not simply in the midst of Israel, his covenant people, but in the midst of all the nations of the earth. In Christ now isn't just for Jews, it's for Gentiles. And this mystery speaks of the reconciliation of Jew and Gentile. So the mystery is both a revelation of who Christ is and a revelation of who makes up his church. And it's a revelation of what we would call today racial reconciliation. The mystery of the gospel, the mystery that, that, that is, is associated with the maturity of the church is people groups who have a historical hostility toward each other being reconciled in Christ. It's, it's Jew and Gentile in terms of the first century. If we go throughout history, it's Palestinian and Jew, Arab and Jew, being brought together in Christ, being reconciled in Christ. In American history, it's white and black. It's indigenous and white being reconciled. It's Hutu and Tutsi being reconciled in Christ. It's Bosnian and Serbian being reconciled in Christ. It's Democrat and Republican being reconciled in Christ. It's old and young being reconciled in Christ. It's male and female being reconciled in Christ. It's, it's throughout all the history of the earth. Europeans and non-Europeans reconciled in Christ. Pakistanis and Indians being reconciled in Christ. It's Chinese and Uyghurs being reconciled in Christ. That's the mystery. Christ in, is in the midst of all the peoples and he wants the peoples to come together and to set aside division that hinders the manifestation of this unity. Now, you know what's, what it's going to take? for the manifestation of this unity to take place, it's going to take suffering. People who have already inflicted suffering on other people and those who've had the suffering inflicted upon them being reconciled, it's going to take suffering. And see, a church that is not willing to suffer. I, I, I do have to make this statement. I, I, I want to contextualize this because, you know, it's people who haven't suffered versus people who have suffered historically in our nation that is, that is causing so much trouble today. It's not telling those people of color and the poor and people who've been oppressed and, and just had all sorts of injustice perpetrated upon them because of race 
oh, just keep suffering. It's the people who've been the perpetrators of that suffering. They need to learn how to suffer too. I'm telling you that what's going on right now, it's like when, when, when people are like saying, the election was stolen from us. Well, it was stolen from white people, apparently, is what the election was stolen from. Well, welcome to the show. Elections have been stolen from the poor, the oppressed, the people of color for centuries. Welcome to the show. What's going on now is just, it's a great equalizer. It's, we all need to learn how to suffer. But leaders, and I can tell you, our church is suffering. Our church is suffering because of the stands we take, the political stands, the stands we take for our brothers and sisters of color, the stands we take against all sorts of injustices. There's a horrible injustice taking place in this nation. It's called abortion. But there have been historical injustices that have been here for hundreds of years and centuries before that to people who are alive. Horrible injustice. And our church is taking a stand on the side of biblical justice. You know, Rob was talking about social justice movements. We're not talking about social justice. Everybody has their aspects of justice. The Republicans have a Republican right-wing justice. The Democrats have a, a, a left-wing aspect, democratic justice. We're talking about biblical justice here. And because our church has taken that stand, you know, we've suffered for that. We're a, we're a multi-ethnic congregation that is trying to demonstrate one new man in Christ, what it looks like, and we're suffering because of it. It's going to take suffering. And it's, it's not just, oh, let's just tell the people who've been suffering for centuries under oppression, we'll just keep suffering some more. No, those who haven't suffered are going to have to learn how to suffer. And guess why we're in pandemic slash civil disruption slash political division in America? The Lord's saying, great equalizer, let everybody suffer. But our hope, in the midst of suffering, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. I'm closing up. My power running out sign is reminding me. Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom so we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The word for warning is admonition. And the, the Greek word for admonish, I'm looking up a, a definition here. Admonish, this word in Greek, normally implies an error that needs to be corrected. It is placing truth in the minds of the church to correct error. It's, it's apostolic teaching. Apostolic wisdom, apostolic admonishment corrects false prophecy and false teaching in the church. And it presses through suffering, if need be, to do that teaching. And right now, I'll tell you, within the church, truth is being proclaimed, false prophecy is being exposed, and the greatest, the greatest amount of disrespect to those who are teaching the truth apostolic is coming from their brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, we have to press through it. That's why earlier on, uh, Paul said in verse 11, uh, with all power, we are being empowered according to the might of his glory for all perseverance and long suffering. And there it is with joy. See, long suffering means we have to press through the suffering that even comes from our brothers and sisters in Christ and proclaim the truth. Admonishment, apostolic admonishment, apostolic teaching that's done in wisdom so that we may present every man mature in Christ. The apostolic imperative is we have to press through suffering. You know why Paul was in jail? <laughs> His own 
fellow Jewish brethren. Now, in that case, that was his, 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 that was the nation he was part of. His fellow citizens put him in jail. So Paul gets flack from his fellow citizens, from his brothers and sisters in Christ, and we in the American church who are standing for apostolic truth get flack from American citizens who don't like what we're saying on both sides of the equation and our own brothers and sisters in Christ. But Paul says, press through, long-suffering, perseverance, so that ultimately we may present every man perfect in Christ. Now remember the birth pangs of Messiah. Paul said, I labor till Christ is formed in you. Labor, that's, that's, the, that's a woman in pain in childbirth. And Paul closes. He says, and it is this apostolic imperative to impart the grace necessary for maturity in the church. That is for which, it is this for which I also labor, striving according. I'm laboring, striving according to his energy that powerfully works in me. There's a divine energy that works in the apostle to keep him proclaiming the truth, praying, thanking, suffering Christologically, rejoicing in the Lord. It keeps him going so that he might labor. The Greek word for labor there is perform hard manual labor. Striving is agonizing. Birth pain. We have a few more verses here, but we'll close. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for all those who are watching, for those who are listening. I pray for apostolic leadership to be raised up at Lord of the Harvest, for apostolic leadership to be raised up in the body of Christ in this region, for apostolic leadership to be raised up in America, for apostolic leadership to be raised up in the earth. That will give thanks to the Lord that will pray without ceasing, that will proclaim the truth regardless of the cost to oneself. In other words, that, that, that one will utilize one's body. We'll, we'll see this embodied reality will be a living testimony of working out the death of Christ and forth that you raise up a church that suffers Christologically, you raise up a leadership that suffers Christologically, that your church might enter into maturity. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace. Thank you for your patience, brothers and sisters. Amen.